Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the CRMG Masterclass, which we've entitled A Risk-Based Approach to Cybersecurity, a Masterclass on what to do and how to do it. Uh, my name is Simon Lacey, and I'll be acting as your host today. This will be an interactive session, so please keep those questions coming in throughout the afternoon. Today's session will be two hours in total, with breaks throughout, throughout and time to take questions. Please submit your questions through the Q&A panel on your Zoom console. This session is being recorded. We will send a copy of the recording and slides to all attendees post-event. Um, so if you need to uh, top up your water bottle or you need to pick up your, collect your Amazon parcel from the front door, don't worry too much, you won't miss any content. This masterclass is a deep dive session aiming to provide clarity on what a good uh, cyber risk management capability looks like and a pragmatic approach to deliver an effective risk assessment. Um, so we will be going into some detail here and that will be backed by some uh, case studies which Martin will be delivering for us later. If we can move on there, Nick. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Firstly, I have Mr. Nick Frost, who is co-founder and director of CRMG. Uh, Nick is uh, previously with PwC and headed up their global information risk function. Afternoon, Nick, how are you? I think you're on mute there, Nick. So that's. Uh... There you go. Hopefully that's better. <laughs> One of the trials and tribulations of doing webinars. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. And uh, thanks everybody for joining. And, uh, you know, we're going to make this, uh, as, as you said, so I'm interactive, going to share lots of ideas, lots of stories uh, and kind of all the hints and tips that we've uh, we've learned uh, as an organization over the years. So uh, that's me. OK, th thanks very much for that, Nick. Um, secondly, I'll be joined by uh, the ever knowledgeable Martin Tully, who is a principal consultant at uh, CRMG. Martin has over 20 years experience in the field of information security and expertise in policies, accreditation, accreditation audits, threat profiles and information risk. Martin had previously worked at uh, PwC and KPMG and has experience in multiple business sectors, including finance, pharmaceuticals, energy and insurance. Hi, Martin. How are you? Yeah, hi, hi Simon, and hi everybody on the uh, on the call today. Um, I'll be sharing a uh, a couple of case studies later on, but uh, as I was mentioned, if you if you do if you have any questions as we go through, and we can um, hopefully answer those as we go through or, or take questions throughout the uh, discussion today. So, I'd, I'd like to talk talk to you a bit later on. Oh, that's that that's great. Thanks, Mark. I'm really looking forward to those case studies because I think that helps put the theoretical into the context of practicality, which I think is really important with this uh, with this topic. And I'm Simon Lacey, um, as you can see on screen there, I'm the former information policy uh, manager, former information security policy manager at the Bank of England, having previously worked for a number of years in the NHS. So Nick, we can move on, thank you. Um, about CRMG, um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, um, but CRMG, it's the Cyber Risk Management Group, is a leading provider of cybersecurity and information risk consultancy services and training courses. Um, you'll see the four key uh, pillars of our business there. Um, and I think what, uh, what we're particularly proud of is the fact that we use pragmatic seasoned professionals. Um, so we, we know uh, um, we use a group of individuals to, to, to provide a consultancy um, that have actually done it in the field and have that experience. So just thinking about the introduction there um, to, the, to the three of us, um, we have over 60 years experience in information security and uh, the other thing that struck me about that photo, those photos, is that uh, we'd make a very poor holiday camp uh, boy band. Um, so in terms of if we look at our supporters today, today's masterclass has been supported by both the Chartered Institute of Information Security and Galvanise and I understand that a number of you will have come through both those routes. Um, please do take the time to check out their websites after the uh, after the masterclass is finished. But thank you very much to those uh, to the supporters of this uh, of this masterclass today. So moving on to today's objectives, uh, four key objectives for us to work through today, where we'll set up the foundations that are needed before you can start assessing risk. And again, that's very important because without firm foundations, then what you build on top of that won't be as effective as you perhaps need it to be. We'll determine what a risk assessment process must cover 
because there are a number of elements there that are fundamental to giving you the right answers that will allow you to inform your business effectively. We'll walk through a plan for establishing a risk capability and a process for evolving one and recognise the future for cyber risk assessment in the context of cyber security today. Um, I won't talk us through the agenda there, but you just see the five agenda items which we'll be planning to cover today. Um, the masterclass has really built on um, what we, we've been doing with Galvanize recently, where we uh, supported with three webinars. Um, one was to compliance to risk, um, which is really the foundation for the masterclass today, because we were, we were um, struck by the number of questions that people were asking to really give that deep dive, to get that further understanding. Um, we, did a work, we did a webinar on the, the mind of the board, so actually understanding how to get the board's attention and also enduring a crisis. So prioritizing the risk, and let's be honest, what we do to manage risk is to, uh, is to prevent problems and allow your organizations to continue to deliver on their business objectives, which actually has been thrown into stark contrast, obviously, in recent weeks. Um, and we had a total of uh, over 500 attendees to those sessions, um, which prompted us to come up with the masterclass that we have today, which is on the first one there, compliance to risk approaches. Um, what we'd like to do, and obviously please indicate if you're interested and like to, to do masterclass on the further two sections too. Anyway, that's enough from me um, in terms of introduction. I'd like to hand you over now to uh, Nick Frost. Nick is going to take us through the first section here, which is setting the scene. Nick, over to you. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully you can hear me okay now. So um, firstly, as Simon mentioned, um, you know, we are going to take two hours and hopefully give you some really really good insights and uh, based on uh, our own experiences in this whole area of cyber risk assessment it's becoming a really crucial area um, generally in cyber security cyber security functions so i want to start off with um just a couple of i suppose you know basic um understanding in terms of why we need to look at cyber risk and then take a deeper dive in, well, how do we do that? How do we assess it? How do we actually implement a capability for cyber uh, security risk assessment? So firstly, what I want to do is just touch on some of the current, I suppose current, but also you know, past approaches, if you like, to cybersecurity that have typically been quite heavily uh, compliance based. And um, one of the things that we've found with compliance based approaches and of course you know i've been in information security for you know, a good 20 years now um where compliance based approaches were the norm and um and they were also sufficient they were adequate for what we were trying to achieve um they were able to identify where we had control gaps um they weren't really very risk driven uh, they're fairly easy to understand fairly easy to apply um, and i think what's happened quite clearly is a increase in targeted attacks, increase in sophistication, you know, nothing new there, we all know that, um, but the compliance-based approaches to cybersecurity, you know, they have limitations. Now, one of the things I just want to emphasize, we're not, we're not launching war against compliance-based approaches here, we're, you know, you can't, I mean, compliance is still going to be here, whether you're complying with standards, legislation, but what we're saying here is that, you know, a, a shift, if you like, from compliance to, to more of a risk-based approach is something that's becoming more and more important. Um, it's becoming more important for a number of reasons. One, um, it, is, it is becoming more of a business imperative to be able to demonstrate um, how and why investment is needed. Um, and in my experience with a lot of compliance-based approaches, um, it's less about under-engineering the controls, but more about over-engineering. So, you know, it was quite common to find, uh, you know, costs and investment being spent in areas that actually weren't really quite needed because they, they weren't exposed to the types of risks in which those controls were, were helping to protect. So, you know, it's becoming more important, both from a business perspective, but also from a cybersecurity uh, perspective in general, to get a much greater grasp and understanding um, on what those risks um, to your organization are um, that could initiate a, a cyber security attack. So a number of reasons why today we're seeing cyber risk uh, and risk assessment approaches in general becoming more important. Um, I think there's a, there's a stronger need to create um, a stronger argument 
uh, greater levels of transparency as to why controls are required. You know, we all operate now in highly dynamic environments and um, anyone who uh, has worked in information security, you know, will understand that quite often you're not, uh, you're, you know, you can be persona non grata. You're not always the most popular person in the room um, when you suddenly announce that <laughs> there are a whole bunch of access controls that need to be applied on a system that's about to go live. So, you know, it is important to look at this race -based, risk based approach and to look at it at, at a very early stage in the development of new systems. Um, but also looking at the opportunities when we need to carry out these cyber risk assessments on, on existing systems. So we can find and derive what those risks are to develop this uh, con, you know, control remediation approach. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you know, business, they get risk, they understand risk. And I think the whole cybersecurity picture is becoming very well understood uh, with C-level individuals. And I actually think that this risk uh, vehicle, if you like, or journey is something that will, you know, if you pitch it right, it will get the, tr the attraction uh, that's required um, and, and that level of commitment that's required to make this a reality. So just a couple of uh, key points here, um, because one of the things I've found um, personally, um, myself, when I've had a range of different risk related roles in cybersecurity, is how important it is to clarify some of the key terms um, yes we are measuring it whether you're measuring it in a qualitative or a quantitative manner but if you are looking at uh, measuring or assessing threats um, or controls or impacts it is important to be able to know exactly what they are and what they're not um, so terminology is really really important um, but you know the basic principles if you like of risk um, are very well known it's probability impact could be termed likelihood of consequence whatever those terms may be but there are typically you know two key components that help us make a better informed view of what those risks are and um you know and so that's that they're the key components that pretty much any risk assessment methodology that's worth its salt needs to needs to focus on whether it's a you know a, a very detailed approach uh, or whether it is you know quite a high level assessment the key points here um, are that it's it's about understanding the impacts um, and the likelihood of a cyber attack occurring. So it's also about the information. Quite often, there's a focus around assessing um, you know systems wire and tin, if you like, and that's absolutely fine as long as you 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 understand that we are looking at the risks to information on those particular systems. And when we look at information in information security, obviously we're looking at uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And whilst this is everything anyone in information security will clearly understand, it is important to keep a tab on these three properties of information because they are going to be needed to, to articulate and present scenarios when you're looking at you know, your business impacts, for example, uh, when you're looking at understanding the types of the threats that could impact either C, I, or A, or all of them. Um, but this is, you know, this is the foundation in terms of when we're assessing uh, risk that we have to look at uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Okay, so, you know, there are other fundamentals here. So if we're going to start looking at establishing what I like to call a, a cyber risk-based capability, um, it's much more than just the methodology. It's much more than having the tool. Um, if we are going to look at establishing it, we need to evolve this whole approach. So you may be an organization that's been carrying out risk assessments, cyber risk assessments for quite a while, and you might be struggling. Um, a lot of organizations are. And hopefully what we can um, help you with today is some of those sort of hints and tips to overcome some of those challenges. Or you may be an organization that you know, that needs to start carrying out your uh, risk assessments. You may be, you know, uh, maybe a regulatory requirement such as, you know, um, PSD2, open banking. Uh, you know, there are a number of regulations out there that are quite explicit now about cyber risk. But before we, but before we look at jumping into the, the process um, or looking at the types of tools and the capability of those tools, it's important to look at the bigger picture here because at some point 
you know, cyber risk is going to be incredibly important in terms of driving a number of key areas, both of cybersecurity and the business. So you have to ensure that you've got, you know, that plan, if you like, for a better word, in place. And that, that plan is covering a number of these key areas. So we're going to go through all of this in the next couple of hours and explain, you know, what those key areas are. But, um, but you know, looking at training and, and education, um, it's important to have experts in this field that really understand, you know, what and how to explain cyber risk or the components of risk, explain the, the value that this is going to provide and compare and contrast a cyber risk approach to, you know, to a compliance led approach. Um, it needs to be a process that fits into your organization too. So it needs to be something that's, you know, considered to be straightforward, especially if you're starting off in this area. Um, it's great to have this platinum level approach and methodology, but if it's not something that people can understand clearly and easily, um, that's going to cause you a world of pain. It's a lot better to start off with something simpler um, and then to start growing into that, uh, growing into that process and approach and evolving it from there on. So we're going to cover all of those particular elements that we've covered um, briefly there. But one of the things I want to um, highlight here is what an approach typically looks like. So this is CRMG's approach. This is our own process, if you like, for carrying out uh, cyber risk assessments. Um, this is based on you know, the team's experience, uh, team's knowledge, working with uh, a number of different clients and also being in operational role. But we're going to walk through each of these seven steps here. Um, and you will see these steps typically in a range of other methodologies as well. So, you know, there's, there's nothing that's completely groundbreaking here, I'll be completely frank. Um, but what is important here is to approach this in a kind of a systematic, repeatable manner. I think that's fundamental because you don't want different parts of your organization going off at different tangents in terms of assessing risk, because at some point you will evolve, you will mature to a point when you want to start aggregating this data together. So it's fundamental to get a consistent approach in place. Um, what is also important, and it's sometimes overlooked, is the ability to report cyber risk. It tends to be an area that's either left out um, of a number of methodologies or not explained in enough detail. <clears throat> and it's absolutely vital to ensure that you can convey and articulate the outputs from your cyber risk assessment, because if anything, you know, the, the output from each of these steps, the output from number seven is probably the most critical because it's going to be sent to stakeholders who will then be, in, you know, informed uh, and be expected to make decisions on whether they're going to mitigate, accept, or how much money they're going to invest, and et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to go through this, uh, each of these seven steps here, um, and we'll do so using a structure that's similar to this, so that we can start to obviously articulate what we consider to be the key activities, the sort of the key hints and tips for each of these particular steps uh, in, in our methodology. And the way we do this here is obviously we've got a um, you know, description of the step. Uh, we share some, if you like, uh, what, you know, what good practice looks like in this area. Um, some of the key inputs you need to consider, the individuals to involve, uh, and an estimated time. Time is always something that you know, organizations are very keen to understand because we want to understand you know, how much resourcing utilization is needed. The one point I would highlight here is the time piece is something I'm basing this on your first uh, first risk assessment. So ultimately, the more risk assessments you do, the quicker it will be. And uh, we have a range of different roles here. They may be you know, different terms, different roles in your organization. But um, but stick with us and we'll we'll walk you through this journey. So. Where should we target the risk assessment? I think that's one of the key questions that we get asked uh pretty much pretty much every day um it's it's a good it's a very good question it's a very logical question and i think the question uh, sets out exactly um how complex uh, a cyber risk assessment can be if you don't get this target profile or the scope right first time so you know our recommendation is especially if you're starting off in this journey or even if you're not even if you're conducting your uh you know your risk assessments you've been doing it for a while Focusing at a, a system or application level, I'm not going to get too much into what's the difference between the two, 
is, a, is probably a good place to start. Uh, it's always good to identify, you know, critical systems, if you like, to your organization. Why? Because typically there's always a, a well-defined system owner um, that needs to be involved, you know, a clear representative in IT that manages those types of controls that knows the architecture. So start off with a, you know, start off with a system that's well known. Um, it's important to not look at over expanding, over extending that scope, you know, and I've seen this happen quite a few times. It's okay to consider how data flows in and flows out with the inbound and outbound systems. Uh, you may want to look at the underlying infrastructure, but be very careful because before you know it, you look at the organization's infrastructure and suddenly your risk assessment now starts to include the internet. So be pretty careful about that. Um, the one thing I would say with any risk assessment is it needs to be structured and it needs to be professionally managed. And the reason I say that is because you will get a range of different individuals giving up their time to take part in something that they don't really understand. They may feel a bit uncomfortable about. So it's absolutely vital to run this in as professional manner as you can. So things like agendas, you know, invites, maybe some kind of lunch and learn just to set the scene, explain what's going to be carried out, and also to explain what you want from those individuals that take part. So agreeing the scope in a workshop is key. Um, the second step, and of course you can combine these steps together in a, you know, in a workshop, but the second step, and this is where I feel organizations cyber security or cyber risk capability can often you know launch um, and, and become very successful and that's the business impact approach so step two is all determining what the business impact so we've already worked out what the target uh, system or systems or environments are that we're going to be assessing um, and understanding you know the types of information that exist or flow to and from those uh, systems or system. The next step now is to look at the business impact, look at the potential impact that could occur. And the way we typically assess impact here from cybersecurity is obviously to look and go through a range of scenarios linked to confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So the key areas that we, we looked at before. Um, now, when you're assessing your business impact, there will be a need to provide a little bit of structure around how you go about assessing impact. And so when you're talking about, you know, what could the impact be to, I don't know, personal information, what could it be to, you know, credit card details, whatever that may be, um, you need something that puts in, that puts on the brakes, if you like, to prevent sort of one individual trying to, you know, or, you know, trying to convey what he or she thinks that impact could be. And this is one tool, it's a quite a powerful tool. Um, we call it, a, uh, a, a reference table um, for cybersecurity it could be called the harm reference table, consequence reference table. There's a range of different terms that are used, um, but you typically will have something like this in your organisation. Um, but if you don't, fine. This is something that was is very um, powerful to help to uh, conduct a business impact assessment. And obviously, when you're looking at impact, you need to look at it a range of different manners. Uh, or different categories, so financial, reputational, whatever that category is. Um, and those categories should be pertinent to your organization. So, you know, if you're, I don't know, in utilities or oil and gas, health and safety is gonna be really, you know, it's gonna be really key. So that needs to be possibly at the top of this table. So it's, you know, subtle changes like that, that become very important because when you run a business impact assessment workshop for the first time, um, you know, the first, category you're going to come up come up come against will will it will you know we'll have a lot of discussion around it so make sure it's a key one but of course the way you'd use this is then to help use these uh, metrics in here to determine what the possible impact would be if there's a breach of confidentiality integrity and availability okay so once we've carried out our business impact assessment we understand the scope we understand the you know, the, uh, the types of data or types of information that are on this particular system or systems, and we now start to understand what the impacts potentially could be. The next step is, is about assessing the threats, assessing the cyber threat landscape. And this is really key for today's cyber risk assessments because it's, the, the, the threat landscape is becoming 
um, a key area for us to gain a good understanding, good knowledge of what those threats are. So range, we'll go through some of the, um, some of the techniques um, and how you actually carry out a cyber threat assessment next. But again, this is gonna require a slightly different audience. Um, the, again, the, the focus here is going to be on um, a workshop and you wanna establish and have a consistent set or list of threats and you need to select the particular threats that you think are applicable to both your organization and both the system under review. So that's, that's important. The one thing I would say about the, the cyber uh, threat step here, it could well be a one-off activity. So one of the things to highlight is, yes, a business impact assessment, um, the profile of the target. There are obviously going to be activities you're going to carry out for each, for each assessment, although you could you could reuse some of that data if it's a similar system, similar data types. Um, but for a cyber threat assessment, you know, you can conduct uh, cyber threat assessments for your particular organization uh, across the enterprise or different units of it. And then you can reuse that information um, for when you're carrying out your, your threat assessments. Uh, we wouldn't suggest a complete copy and paste, um, but you could certainly uh, reuse uh, the information and the, uh, the threat rating. So when we talk about threats, this is really important to, you know, to understand what is a, a cyber threat and what is not, because quite often we see um, threats described when actually they're control weaknesses. So it is important to look at threats. Um, and you could look at it both in terms of threat actors. So you could look at, you know, common one being nation states, hacking groups. Um, and then, you know, threat vectors. There may be different terms that you would use, which could be, you know, deployment of malware. So what we need to do here is obviously when we're assessing the threats, we need to look at key areas, um, such as the, the capability of the threat. You know, do we anticipate that that threat is going to target our organization? Um, you know, you may be a defense contractor. Uh, you that would have a particular... Uh, type of threat profile. You may be, um, you know, as I say, maybe in oil exploration where you've got a concern around hacktivists. Uh, you may hold credit card information. You may carry out credit checks where you're going to have a wealth of this information, which may start to attract, you know, hacking groups where there's a financial motivation. So it is important to go through um, those particular threats with the context of your organization as well as the system. Once we've got an understanding of those threats, the next step obviously is to look at what controls we've got in place. How vulnerable are we to those threats? And this is, once we've assessed threats, once we've assessed vulnerability, then we're in the place where we've, we've got a good understanding about what, our, what the likelihood is um, of a cyber attack occurring. So a number of simple sort of straightforward techniques that, uh, that we can employ here. Um, first one is, I think, agreeing on the control library. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be what's in your policies. Uh, it could be something more detailed, um, but it's important to agree on what is a control library. It's also important to agree in terms of the, the, the target that you're profiling. So if you are looking at systems and applications, then obviously you want a control library that contains controls to do with systems and applications. If you're looking at a, a you know, data center or even a broader part of the business unit, uh, you know, you might want to aggregate some of those controls that are representative uh, of the environment that's, that's uh, under review. But one of the things to remember here, though, is with each of, when you're developing these types of templates, where it's looking at threats, whether it's looking at controls, it is well worth the investment in developing these templates because they will be re reused. So if you've got I don't know, you've developed a control template that aligns to PCI, for example, and you have multiple financial systems in existence, or you've got new financial systems coming through the process. Great, that's a control template that naturally will get you to zero to 60. So that's the place um, to start when we're starting to develop these control templates. Now, the key thing when we're developing um, and looking at those controls is we need to understand the extent to which um, you know, those controls are related to the prioritized threats we've identified in the previous step. So, you know, if you were looking at, you know, we've, we've, we've identified that malware or phishing, uh, you know, is a real area of concern for the organization. We might want to start looking at controls that are both related to individuals like awareness, education, uh, as well as the technical controls. You know, have we got AV on all the key servers? 
uh, in the organization? Or do we need threat intelligence to help us give a better informed view about the types of malware related attacks we may be experiencing? So it's thinking about designing your control set according to the threats that you've identified before. Um, and the objective, obviously, with a, a cyber vulnerability assessment here is to determine uh, the control weaknesses. And what we want to try and identify here are really about, you know, what are the critical controls to help mitigate or remediate that threat? Um, and what is the extent in which they're operating effectively? Because the ideal sort of panacea, if you like, is to be able to identify those controls that are, um, will help remediate that, those, uh, that particular threat, but they're not actually operating very effectively. Um, because then, you know, they're already there, you don't need to invest in it. It's a case of going in, maybe in configuring or understanding um, why those controls are not operating effectively. So, you know, a range of different frameworks that, that obviously we could use to help build these control libraries. And it doesn't have to be one individual control library or standard that's used out there, um, but you could be a mixture of both of these. Um, and ultimately, if you are, um, you know, if you are regulated, you may have standards and, and, and uh, policies that you need to incorporate into that overall control framework as well. So at this point, we've effectively got all the uh, ingredients, if you like, to help us now determine um, what those risks are. So we talked earlier before about those two key components, impact, which we've derived from the business impact assessment and probability, which is derived from uh, assessing threats and, uh, and vulnerabilities or control weaknesses. So once we've got that information, now we've got the ability to be able to calculate and prioritize uh, those risks. And again, this is an activity that we would, uh, we would suggest is carried out without engaging the business so far. I think it is important that we highlight um, or we establish what is a, a, a sort of, if you like, a draft prioritized cyber risk uh, landscape for the system or application under review. And the reason I say that is because when we come to look at the mitigating controls, you want to have both your prioritized risks and what you consider to be the remediatory controls that are needed to reduce those risks. What you don't want to do uh, is get into a meeting where you present your cyber risk landscape and the system owners, the business owners, you walk them through it, they get it, and they say, right, okay, I get that. Uh, what's the next step? So you want to be able to have this next step in mind, which is all about the, uh, the remediation activities. And I'll cover that uh, on the next slide. So just as a recap, when we determine in cyber risk, we're looking at um, these two key components, probability and impact. And I know there's a, sometimes a desire to try and um, you know, increase the sophistication of, of what a cyber risk assessment should do. We'll, we'll touch on this a bit later. Um, but, you know, to get started um, and to get the basics right and to get those foundations running perfectly, you know, if you feel there's a need to sort of take a couple of step back, uh, steps back, just keep focusing on understanding what the impacts are and what the probability are to help understand and make a, a at the end of the day, it's making a better informed view of what you consider those risks to be. So once we've got our prioritized uh, cyber risk um, profile, um, obviously now we need to think about, right, what's, what does remediation look like? So, and, and this is, you know, this is the fundamental part in terms of making that engagement and it's being seen for that engage this cyber risk engagement to be successful because we need to introduce an element of um, pragmatism here because whilst we can highlight what we consider to be you know the platinum level controls that will effectively reduce the risk to you know to very low levels um, we've also got to consider a range of other factors that we'll look at a bit later cost you know implementation factors um, the other part that we, the other activity here that we need to consider is how we're going to articulate this, how we're going to report it, how we're going to convey this information uh, to the stakeholders, to the system owners um, and to the business owners. And there may well be different recipients uh, of these types of reports and this activity. So you may have, you know, individuals in the IT team, in the agile teams, for example, who just literally want to be told, tell me what I've got to implement. I don't have much time to make these uh, 
you know, changes to the system. Um, you may have the business owner that may just be interested in understanding how, you know, what impact looks like. Um, you may have individuals in cybersecurity who really want to understand, you know, what, you know, what are the prioritized risks so we can start to look at scenario planning, if that's the case but with business continuity. So there are a number of, you know, recipients that need to be considered when we carry out this risk remediation and reporting activities. And when I talk about these controls and presenting the remediation activities, um, obviously there's going to be this logical flow. Typically, I would, if I was going to, you know, from 30,000 feet, I would do three key steps or answer three key questions. You know, question one, what is it we've carried out? Go through the process, highlight the the, you know, the consistent, logical approach to which you have assessed your cyber risks. Number two, present what those risks are, but present them and make sure that the language is right for the audience. Um, or come on to this sort of how you convey in, uh, that, uh, that, that risk uh, picture and what two examples of risk reports. So think about the way in which you're going to illustrate these risks to the recipients, because ultimately we want to try and induce a discussion. We want to get a dialogue going you know, with people in the business, with people in IT. Um, and it's sometimes a lot easier to do that when you've got your risk reports um, crafted in a manner that is easy to, to explain and articulate. Once we've got that, the third part then is obviously presenting, presenting back the controls. What do we think of those remediation activities that are needed? Now, when we do that, there is a tendency sometimes to uh, think that, you know, people in the business or the system owners they just want to hear about the, you know, the latest and greatest and strongest controls. Um, so, you know, our recommendation here is to provide options to the system owners and the business owners for a number of reasons. One, um, cost is going to become a big question. You know, what are the options for, you know, option one, maybe, you know, a, a high, you know, an expensive control that helps reduce the, the risk significantly. But cost, in, my, in our experience, cost is often not the, the overriding factor for where the risks will get accepted or, or, or remediated. The overriding factor can quite often be, you know, how much disruption uh, implementing these changes will be. You know, if you suddenly got to launch a, an awareness program across your organization, there may be con some concerns around utilization of staff. And, you know, staff may not be, depending on the culture of your organization, may not be that receptive to, uh, to receiving uh, you know, a, a security awareness program. Um, there may be general complexity issues. Um, you know, the timescale in which to be able to implement and make these changes actually may, may not make good sense to be able to you know, reduce the risk in, in the required time. So a range of different key uh, criteria that need to be considered. And these need to almost be presented back to say, hey, we've considered all these particular attributes uh, before we've actually decided on what the risk remediation steps are going to be. Okay, and then we come into the cyber risk reporting. Um, so now we've got this really rich source of information. How are we going to convey this in a common language that uh, recipients are going to easily understand? And ideally, you know, challenges, uh, create that dialogue. Um, get, you know, have them to, to ask those kind of questions that allows us to go into a little bit more detail to validate thinking and logic that we've applied to this. Because ultimately, we want to create that level of assurance to the recipients of these reports that, you know, we followed a, you know, a robust process uh, for, a, for, a, for our assessing uh, cyber risks to these key systems. And this is, you know, uh, this is ideally presenting this report back again into a workshop which incorporates you know your presentation of the of those uh, of the process you followed um, but when we look at reporting risk um, it, it, it's really really important to define and create a narrative for a better word on um, on what that risk looks like so the range of different techniques there's no universally accepted approach if you like for reporting cyber risk. I've seen lots of examples, lots of variations. This is one example here. And, uh, you know, Simon said before, you know, we can, we can send these uh, slides around. So you've got, uh, got some ideas in these slides, you know, but, but ultimately we want to be able to articulate the types of attacks that can occur, the types of impacts that can result, and then to provide a range of different options for what controls are needed. Um, and if you're able to provide some kind of estimate 
uh, cost for these, um, then that's important because there will be some questions around cost. And okay, we're never always going to have the time or ability to go into and identify what these costs are. But again, if you can provide ranges, you know, typically what we're looking at, um, present the type, the levels of disruption that could occur. Uh, you may want to even go further to start identifying how you're going to improve your alignment to different uh, policies and standards and regulations. So there's a number of vari variants, if you like, to be able to incorporate uh, in a risk report. Here's another uh, example here. And, um, you know, the world's divided when it comes to heat maps. I'll be honest with you. A lot of people, you know, can construct a pretty, you know, uh, robust academic argument in terms of why they don't work and whereas other people uh, other clients of ours you know they have a huge amount of success because it's all about being able to illustrate risks uh, in cybersecurity to individuals that may not be that familiar with it so you know one of the one of the sort of um, you know some of the techniques that we've seen at CRNG um, is this kind of before and after approach um, and you can model this, you know, you can repeat the assessment if you need to. So you've got two variants of the uh, of your cyber risk assessment to prove um, how, you know, these particular controls, um, you know, have lowered the risk. Obviously, you know, this is based on individual's judgment, uh, but that's what, uh, that's what risk is really all about. It still comes down to human judgment. But again, these are just sort of ideas and techniques and templates and formats that can be used. And they, in our experience, they are used effectively. Um, to be able to convey um, what those risks are and, and how they can mitigate them. Um, just a quick one there, obviously there's a range of different uh, you know, products out there. We, uh, we're working with a company called Galvanize and to develop uh, our own cyber risk assessment tool. And you know, this is one example in terms of the ability to, uh, to report uh, risk back, whether it's using heat maps, whether it's using whatever form uh, you can use to be able to articulate what those risks are. So, um, so at that point, we've walked through, if you like, uh, each of those seven steps that that uh, that we suggest need to be followed uh, from end to end as part of a risk assessment to establish this capability. Um, so now we've got a uh, a section to for Martin and I to answer any questions. So, Simon. I don't know if you've received any. Yeah, hi Nick. Uh, yeah, we've 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 um, <laughs> we've been inundated with questions, which is absolutely fantastic. But please do keep those questions coming in. Um, just being aware in terms of our time constraints here, if we will just pick a couple of those, and if we can keep those answers, uh, Nick Martin, um, if we can keep those fairly brief, that would be fantastic. Um, okay, first question we've had here that's that, that's come in that uh, I'd like to pose to you. So if we if we talk about this in terms of uh, um, obviously, a lot of the, the, the listeners here will be uh, familiar with ISO, etc. Uh, if I address this question to you, Martin, um, where would you see the context of the organisation coming into this? Obviously, that's something that's a key component of uh, ISO. Where would you expect to, to cover this in this approach? Well, it's a, and it's a, it's a good question. I think it's, um, it, it, it's, it's one that um, you, you, you know, I think you need to keep in mind all the way through the process, to be, to be honest with you. I think... Um, the context, the uh, you know the industry sector, the kind of business processes that are involved. Um, you know, if you're risk assessing a system or application, all that all of that information should be captured. You know, ideally, first of all, in a profile um, or scoping uh, sessions, um, and they, they often do then help to inform the kind of answers that you might put it. You might be um, asking a, a group in, in terms of a business impact uh, workshop as well. So, um, you're having the context of the organisation in mind throughout those those discussions. That will then help you. To understand what, what is you know what is the financial uh, impact, what is operational impact for for our particular organ organisation, the context that we're in, the industry sector that we're in, you know what what are the, what are the impacts um, for us for this particular um, uh, type of uh, type of threat or risk that we're that we're facing on the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. So, so the context of the of the organisation primarily capture it in the in the scoping and profiling, but it is. Um, it is important to consider that all the way through the process to then determine, okay, what, what kinds of threats are we or should we be susceptible to? Um, and, and then also the controls that are, you know, that have been, um, that have been uh, processed as, but on the back of the budget or any controls that are particular to the context of the organisation as well. So, so, it, so it is throughout the risk assessment, but you can capture it um, you know, in the scoping and profiling to then inform um, kind of business impact decisions. 
Okay, that, that, that's great. Uh, th thanks for that, Martin. Um, so, to, so, so this question perhaps to Nick. Um, obviously not everybody on, on this uh, masterclass this afternoon is necessarily going to be a cyber, a cyber security sure. specialist. Sure. Um, and we're going to have people that perhaps sort of in, in the context of cyber security we consider like business owners. Um, yes. So sort of risk owner type role. Um, and obviously this, this, this model we're using here aligns with perhaps some conventional risk management type models. Yes. Um, but obviously the, the key to that is, is identification of the risk. It's critical to its success. Yeah. So sort of boiling it down, what, how do you actually identify that, the, the, the risks that you need to mitigate? And that's probably a really broad question. We could probably talk about that for 20 minutes on itself. But if it's a, <laughs> a cyber specialist, could give them a two line answer to that. I know that's an impossible, impossible question there. <laughs> well, no, 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 I think it's absolutely fine. All questions are valid here. here. Um, so if I was to go with a two-line answer, I would ensure that you've got a, uh, a practical, repeatable uh, process, uh, and it's one that fits within your organization. Um, so that would be my kind of two-line uh, two message, is just to expand on that a little bit. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier on, if you look at evolving your cyber risk capability, you're going to have far more success. You really are. There's sometimes a tendency to try and overcomplicate a risk assessment. And, you know, you need, but you need to have the right culture. You need to have the right maturity, the right experience, the right data. Don't try and sort of hit 100 miles an hour right away. I mean, you know, your most important clients or recipients uh, to, that, that need to need that we need to ensure they understand are the stakeholders of the system or application or the business, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, once you've got that assurance and understanding, um, or those individuals have that assurance and understanding, that's fine. Now you can start to do some of the more complicated, you know, um, aspects of, of how you assess it, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. We'll look at, we'll look at some of those quantitative aspects a bit later. Um, but, you know, that would be, that would be my sort of response, response to, to that question. Okay, that's great. Sorry, that was a, a really tough question to give you to a quick answer. Um, and I've just had one more pop in here, and, I'll, and I'll, I, will, I will ask this one before we move on to the next section there. Because um, I think it's something that all of us as practitioners will have seen on multiple occasions. Um, the risk, uh, so um, it seems you have to be careful not to just list uh, lots of issues rather than fo fo risk focus, risks that are focused on the business. How do you try and ensure the risk register is not just an ever increasing list of everything? So that'd be to Martin. So we've all seen this where the risk, re risk register becomes just sort of a dumping ground for every concern that everybody's got across the business. And they feel that they, because they've shifted it onto somewhere else, so that's, that's solved. Um, how, what would you think about that, Martin? Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a really good question. It, um, it it is it is often seen. I'm sure everybody on the on the uh, uh, the inter interactive call today has, has at some point in their careers maybe seen risk registers that are as long as your arm. Um, you know, with, with risks that might have been there for a, a long period of time. Um, in in some cases, and some some risks on the risk, risk register, you. you yeah, the, the 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 whole point sometimes the risk register is to record it somewhere, and some of the risks are so um, uh, critical and important that there there's 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 often uh, on the face of it not a lot that's done to maybe mitigate them. But sure, there's there's some projects you might be able to link to particular risks on there, but but it is it is very important whether you, whether you have you know maybe a, 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 a two different types of risk register, ones that ones that more operational wide, but one that might be much more focused on a uh, particular team, like an information security risk that then feeds into maybe a high level uh, risk register. But primarily speaking, you, d you do need you know, somebody that's on the hook to make sure that within, a, within an agreed time scale that a set of mitigations are, are in place and then reassess the risk after those mitigations have been put in place to sort of see, okay, well, have we, can we downgrade that risk now or is it still at a, a high um, importance, high criticality, even though the mitigating actions that we've said we've put in place within a defined period have now been put in place. So that kind of bit of reassessment there is impossible. Somebody on the hook for making sure that happens um, and time scales to make sure that, you know, within a, an agreed time scale, this set of, of mitigation actions we put in place. Let's now re let's now reassess that risk. Is it still on the risk register? Yes or no? Um, you know, is the, is the importance or the criticality of that reduced off the back of these mitigating actions? So, um, yeah, it it is a a bit of a minefield. But th those are those are some of the ways where you can start to 
uh, you know, rationalise and manage the, the expectations of everybody and the, you know, to do with the risk, the risk register going forward. Okay, well that, that's, that's great. Thank, thanks for that, Martin. Um, again, thank you for all the questions that have been coming in. Um, we're we're, we're, we're endeavouring to answer as many as we can behind the scenes as we go. So please keep those questions in and apologies if we can't answer them all live. So if we'd like to move on now to section three, which is building on solid, solid foundations, Nick, can you take us through that process? Yeah, certainly. And um, yeah, I was going to say, actually, just to everybody, if um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, we will do, I think Simon mentioned it earlier, is, you know, we're going to collate all these questions and uh, like we've done on all the other uh, webinars, we'll, we'll sort of expand and, you know, put a, put a response to those. So even if uh, you have a question in mind that you're desperate to get an answer to, just ping it on there and we'll, we'll come back with a response. Um, okay, so, right, let's Let's talk about this next section here. This is what we call building on solid foundations at CRMG. So we've gone through, if you like, CRMG's approach to cyber risk assessment. Um, and as I said before, you know, that's based on, uh, on our own experience. Um, and you could, you know, you can see, and you can see reflections of, of that approach in, you know, in a lot of methodologies. There's not really sort of anything, uh, you know, massively different between a lot of these qualitative methodologies. So, um, but the key thing that I just want to emphasize with a uh, risk assessment approach is the reporting element. That's really, really important because ultimately, you know, you want to ensure that you've got to make good use of all that information. And obviously there's a number of ways in which you can present and, uh, and establish a, a good dialogue around that risk picture. Okay, so what I want to talk about now is, is more around this sort of, this you know evolutionary piece if you like we talked uh, talked a lot about uh, i've used that word quite often in this presentation um and you know we've got um i think pretty much everyone in the team uh has been in information or cyber security for the best part of 20 years so we've seen this sort of shift happen from compliance to risk so we've also seen this evolution of how you can take a risk-based approach and evolve it um and we've also hit probably a, a lot of potholes along the way. So I'm going to try and sort of uh, in the next, you know, 20 minutes, if you like, try and articulate and convey what, what good looks like. So if you're looking to roll out uh, a, a cyber risk assessment across your enterprise, these are the things you, you need to consider. And it's not exhaustive. There's lots of other things here, but let's kick off. So, you know, our, the, the, the key objective here is we're introducing change uh, to an organization. And for us to enable that change to be successful, you know, there needs to be a lot of influencing that needs to go on. Um, it might, you know, whatever you call it, influencing, socialization. You know, the point is we need to present a pretty solid business argument as to why um, cybersecurity needs to be more risk driven. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that because um, we don't have the time. But, you know, that business awareness is really, really vital. Um, just to jump down to, uh, to the point which we call the risk review board, I, I, I would encourage anybody to establish uh, a risk review board. Now, you may already have an existing board or committee. Um, use that one so if you've got some you know if you have this group of people that, that come together every month or every quarter uh, to look at anything to do with risk in general uh, or cyber security whatever it may be <clears throat> that's ideal that is the platform that you need um, and in my previous organization uh, we had an information risk review board and it worked perfectly uh, not all the time <laughs> but it worked really really well and on that board we had you know individuals from uh, head of legal, uh, individuals from operations, uh, CIO or representatives of the CIO. So we had all the key people on there to start reaching a consensus in terms of, do they agree with the risk we've identified? Um, you know, have they got any questions to validate it? Do they agree most importantly on the mitigating strategy? Um, if you get those people on board, decisions can be made that both help you manage risk and manage risk both not just in a cyber security perspective but also from a business perspective because you know you can imagine how much change is going on in organizations today especially you know if you're in retail you speak to a number of retail clients and everything is now shifting towards the dot-com environment you know stores are going to struggle for a, a while this year we all know that 
So there's significant changes going on. And if we can get in there with the right people using boards and platforms or committees, whatever you want to call it, um, it's going to make life a lot easier for everybody. So, okay, so it's jumped ahead slightly there. But, right, you want to start off creating this capability. Number one, we are talking about something that is quite specialised. Right? We know we want to make it simple and straightforward. But there is an element here of equipping individuals with the right skills and the training that's needed. Um, now, you may have individuals in your security that have a security background that are, you know, ideal candidates for cyber risk assessments. But also look further afield. Um, in my experience, you know, we've had a lot of success with in my teams before with uh, individuals that come from the business. And I sometimes think it's easier to teach individuals in the business about cyber risk management then it's easier to teach individuals in cyber security about the business. Um, you may have a different view, that's fine, but just broaden that sort of scope. Um, and if you mention the word cyber security or cyber risk to most people in the organization, they're, you know, they're going to they're gonna be interested. I mean, you can't not ignore uh, the profile of cyber security today. So that's one aspect, looking at training and education and understanding you know, the skill sets you think you need. Number two, project two. Once you've got that, uh, training and effectively that skills capability established. Now we need to test this approach. So assuming we've got a methodology, assuming we've got some level of automation, let's focus on carrying out pilot assessments. Um, now, we want to focus on systems that are well known. Now there is an argument to say, uh, why would you want to do that? Because if you're going to go for your mission critical systems and you're going to start pilot testing, you may, you know, you may make mistakes. Well, that's true. But you don't necessarily have to take the results of this. The whole purpose of this is to figure out what a good practical approach for cyber risk assessments is going to be for your organization. But the other important factor here is that when you are pilot testing assessments, you want to focus those pilot assessments on systems that have a great level of visibility. Why? Firstly, you're going to get a level of input um, uh, from key stakeholders. Secondly, if you get it right, which is not a word if, you will get it right, you know, there's going to be a great deal of value and informed views and critical thinking that you can demonstrate as to why investment is needed for these systems. So, you know, don't go for low level systems that nobody understands, people are squabbling around to identify who's the owner, who's not the owner. Just go for some of those key systems. It is a pilot assessment. You set out your business case for why we need to adopt a risk-based approach. So, you know, you're in a pretty good position. But the third project here really is around the data sets and customization. So one of the things that I think scares a lot of people when they carry out cyber risk assessments is that they feel that they have to repeat these threat assessments, these control assessments time and time again. You don't. You, you need to look at customizing some of these data sets as part of this bigger program. So, you know, you might want to tackle certain environments for developing your threat list. You might want to look at, I don't know, endpoint environments. You might want to look at technology such as cloud technology, uh, database uh, technology, you know, uh, mobile technology, what, whatever that particular area or environment you're looking to assess, you know, start to look at those types of uh, customized data sets. Because once you've got that library of data sets, you can start to pull that into the types of tools that we, we'll talk about a bit later to help streamline and process that. Um, just going back to this risk review board here, you know, what is the objective and purpose of this risk review board? Um, sometimes, and this may be a number of you on the call, you may feel that sometimes you're um, you might be dealing with stakeholders um, that were willing to accept a level of risk that makes you feel uncomfortable. I, I, you know, I've seen that a few times before. Um, that's not your decision. Unfortunately, as risk analysts, we can inform and we can advise, but you know, ultimately the decision comes down to the owner of that particular system, that application, or even the information. So if we're able to uh, achieve a level of transparency about what decisions are being made by these stakeholders, uh, it's better to do that with a consensus and to do that through a review board. Um, and that's where I've seen review boards operate very effectively, where you, where that individual, uh, you know, may be challenged as to why uh, they are willing to accept that risk. Or, you know, whoever's the chair of that risk review board, you know, may decide to, you know, to, to not uh, accept these risks and they need to be mitigated, which does really to, 
you know, a potential uh, delay in the project. So that risk review board has a really, really important, um, you know, uh, level of accountability. So once we've got a number of these key building blocks established, then we start to, we want to start looking at, um, you know, the automation side of things, um, typically GRC uh, pro uh, software evaluation projects. We want to do this for a number of reasons. Um, one, you're going to start, if you're successful, you're going to start accelerating the number of uh, cybersecurity risk assessments. So, you know, if you're in the finance sector, for example, there will be a requirement to conduct cyber risk assessments on a range of different systems and on a fairly frequent basis. Um, you don't want to be using, you know, a paper-based approach or uh, Excel-based approach. You want to have a, a fairly, you know, robust GRC product. And the reason why is because when you start to identify the types of themes that you're identifying, that's going to give you a good level of informed view about the cybersecurity, maybe transformation projects. You know, you might start to see there's a bigger need for, you know, dual factor authentication arranged around the critical systems you've assessed. Uh, you might start to be able to articulate the types of impacts that could occur. And if you start to develop those types of themes, you know, if you start to understand the types of impacts that are common, then that's really rich information for you to start looking at, um, you know, continuity planning, disaster recovery, crisis management, because you can start to use that information to practice, you know, what happens when we think a DDoS attack is going to occur. So there's a lot of information when you get from these cyber risk assessments that often hits a sort of a glass ceiling, um, but it shouldn't. It should be used for a range of different areas. Um, the last project, sorry, just to, to sort of uh, wrap up here. We know that um, we know that it's not that far off for more of a real-time cyber risk um, assessment capability. Um, it's not going to be perfect first first time around. I'll talk a little bit more about this, but data feeds are becoming increasingly important to help make more accurate and objective decisions around, you know, control effectiveness, uh, whether we think actually our original perception of threats is correct, depending on what uh, data feeds we're getting from the SOC or any threat intelligence sources. So, um, so that's some of the building blocks here. And, you know, I just want to emphasize here about the um, the ability, if you like, to uh, structure and start to aggregate some of these key themes you're going to get from your risk data. So obviously we're, we're looking here much further down the line when you've conducted a number of risk assessments, maybe across, you know, different divisions in your organization. You may look at different countries, uh, depending on the size of your organization. You know, I've worked for uh, very large organizations in the past and we used to have a tier one, tier two, tier three, where it's based on, you know, the amount of revenue for different countries that we're bringing in. So there's, there's lots of different ways you can obviously slice and dice your organization, but that's important to at least recognize and appreciate because when you start to roll out your uh, risk assessment capabilities, you know, you might want to start looking at a range of different data sets that can support the finance department. Uh, you know, the sales and marketing, they may have different levels of risk appetite, for example, than legal. And you've got to recognize that and appreciate it. So it's important to look at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, structuring, if you like, your risk assessments across these different parts of the organization. And you may even want to have a, you know, a head of information risk for each of these particular uh, divisions or groups within your organization. And then ultimately, you know, this is where the trending analysis comes into play. And this is where I've seen, you know, really powerful informed views um, at an enterprise level, because th there's always an argument here about how local should our risk reviews be, okay? And aggregation is, is something everybody, you know, wants to know and how, what's the best way of doing it. There are some, you know, there are some pros and cons with each of these, but ultimately, you know, starting off and looking and conducting risk assessments across maybe different business divisions, different parts of your organization, you know, based on geographies, you can start to provide a much more localized flavor for the risk profile for systems in that entity for a better word. But then you can start to aggregate that upwards because at some point you might want to start looking at shared services, you might want to look at enterprise transformation project, and that's where for cybersecurity, and that's where uh, looking at these key themes at the business division level can start to help inform a more enterprise view um, and ultimately lead to more enterprise 
few uh, funded security transformation projects. So that's just a, a kind of a, a concept and illustration, if you like, in terms of how, you know, how we've seen it, how we've helped organisations uh, and how we've been involved in exactly those uh, those types of structured uh, approaches to a risk programme. Um, now, the other point, just to emphasise uh, a little bit more about, you know, this risk risk data, it is Again, I'm going on about it a bit, but it's something it's something I feel that a lot of organizations tend to miss out. So it, let's let's be honest. It's it's giving you a lot of good informed view and information. You know, if we approach cyber risk as an exact science, forget it. It's not going to work. So, you know, we are talking here about an informed view and trying to be as objective as we can with understanding what those risks are. But this information about the prioritized risk, it can be reused and used to help a range of other areas, key areas in your cybersecurity roadmap and strategy. So, you know, we see this so often, updating policies and standards. Organizations are often looking to compare and contrast their standard with, you know, an industry recognized standard. There's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's not something that's going to reflect your risk profile of your organization. So if you do have a big problem with accidental mistakes or phishing attacks, or you know, if you are, as I mentioned before, a defense contractor and you're really concerned about some of the unauthorized access attempts going on, well, you can get that information from, from your risk cyber risk assessments. That should then be used to inform the level of controls and control expectations in your policies and standards. So that's one example. You know, there are other examples here too, because um, if you look at the bubble at the bottom around the whole supply chain, uh, it's something we're, we're looking at and probably something we're going to sort of present on in the, in the near future too. Um, you know, given the fact we're in this situation today with COVID, a lot of organizations are going to be looking to, to save money. One of the key areas to save money is to, to, to host, you know, systems, services into the cloud. That's going to happen. That's been happening you know, and accelerating for the past five years. But one of the things we have to understand, well, not we, but our business colleagues need to understand is whilst you can outsource these services and these systems, you can't outsource a risk. The risk is still ours. So if there's something that we can gain from our risk assessments, we can look at how that can help inform legal and procurement when they're starting to shape these contracts. So if we want greater transparency or greater assurance around I don't know, malware protection, uh, or encryption of endpoint devices, whatever it may be, that should be informed from our knowledge of the risks that we've carried out within our organisation. So anyway, just a, just a couple of, you know, emerging uh, or key themes, if you like, for the broader roadmap in information security. Um, and just to, just to emphasise a little bit more, just very briefly, um, on how this information can be used to update policies and standards. And again, this is you know, we've done this for a number of clients. It, it, it may not be applicable for your organization, but one of the, I suppose, one of the observations we've made when it comes to policies and standards, a couple of key things to emphasize. Policy is still king in, in organizations, okay? Businesses get policy. You know, you've got your expense policy, you've got your, your legal policy, whatever it may be, your HR policy, but it's a recognized document at a very high level in your organization. So, and it's no different for, cybersecurity or information security policies. But one of the things that we observe in a lot of policies, and this may be something you can, you know, you can attune to, is the document, it could be you know, 20, 30 pages, 100 controls, might be aligned to a range of well-known standards out there. But it often doesn't include some kind of reference to how important that control is. And again, if we're able to utilize our knowledge of risk, uh, from our risk assessments and start to develop these themes for the organization, we can then start to use that to help identify, you know, what are the fundamental controls in our policy or critical controls? And you don't have to get super sophisticated with this. You just literally need to ensure that you're highlighting out of your, you know, 100 or 50 or whatever number of controls, that there is a difference in terms of their importance um, for when you're looking at assessing against them. Uh, it can help inform security audits, so they spend more time on developing test procedures for the critical controls rather than the nice to house. But again, this should all be informed with in, in, you know, knowledge and insight into the risks. Um, and just before I finish this uh, section, the question we, we, we also get often asked is, 
when should we do risk assessments? That's a really, really good question. Um, and one of the things I would say is, you know, don't, don't base your assessment um, schedule on time. Um, yes, you probably should think about doing it at a point in time when you can, but don't rule out anything else. So for example, you know, if you've been hit by a security incident on a finance system, you, that might be a trigger to review and reassess um, those types of systems. Um, there may be a change within your organization. You know, we know there's going to be an increase in uh, M&As, mergers and acquisitions, because of the nature of the economy and where we are today. So a lot of people are going to be <clears throat> willing to sell. Um, so, you know, if you're going to acquire an organization that may be in a competitor, uh, it's well worth carrying out your uh, your cyber risk assessments and due diligence in that area. Um, you might want to look at you know any changes in regulation, for example. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, open banking, PSD two. Um, you know, organisations that have you know some kind of financial transactions. Uh, you know, according to you know with a web front end. You know, these are systems that, uh, if not already, will be heavily regulated against and will require. Uh, you know, a cyber risk assessment. We're, just on this point, we're seeing, um, we're seeing regulations being really quite explicit now around cyber risk assessment. So if you want to take a look at, as I said, PSD2, there's a number of sources around open banking. Um, the one that I, I actually, <laughs> it's quite sad, I quite, li I quite like one, which is the New York Department for Financial Services, um, because it's well written. Uh, it explains very clearly um, you know, what cyber risk assessment uh, approach looks like. Um, and it's really good news. You know, that's, that's what organizations now need to do. And it's couched in a language that's easy to grasp. It's not the usual sort of, um, you know, uh, regulatory text you often see. So anyway, so a number of key triggers there um, that will require you to think about when you do your risk assessments. So, um, okay, Simon, over to you. Yeah, th thanks for that, Nick. Um, that, there's a, a lot of information you've covered there. That's, uh, that, that's brilliant to get that across. Um, yeah, a question I have here is, um, yeah, perhaps I'll address this to Martin, if I can bring you in, Martin. Um, triggers. So the, so the previous slide there, Nick, shown is the tri triggers for risk assessment. Um, in your experience, how realistic is, it, is that to, 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 to action those risk assessments based on those triggers? Do you find organisations sort of embrace that? Or do they think, oh, we've got a leg regulatory requirement, we've got to risk assess again, and we only did it three months ago, et cetera, et cetera. Or do you find organisations quite uh, embracing of that? Um, I'd say, yeah, I suppose whether organisations em embrace it or not is a, is a, is a, good, is a good question, probably a se separate one. But, de but definitely, um, yeah, to back up what Nick was saying there, uh, yeah, change is, is, you know, so whether it's a significant business change, um, change in situation or where change generally is is usually the reason for um you know, maybe sort of conducting a risk assessment maybe maybe risk assessments might have been conducted in the past they might have been paper-based for example but but now because of a <clears throat> compliance requirement or regulate regulatory requirement new technologies or change in business operations generally um now there's a a, a real need to be you know, much more structured and formal of a, of conducting a risk assessment now. So, um, so it's a primary, primary change. Yeah, whether it's embraced by by organisations, it, it varies to different degrees. But um, there's usually a you know a, a real driver behind why organisations are you know doing risk assessments and doing them properly. Uh, and then once you you know probably probably going away from this this question just a little bit. Once once they are in place and they're formal and they they are. Um, uh, there's a risk assessment process that's been developed and is working well. Um, then it becomes, you know, a little bit more straightforward then for for for, re, for doing risk assessments in year two, year three, and beyond. So, um, so there is a as a as a driver there from a change perspective, but also a a driver for you know just for internally in the organisation once it has been established, it, it becomes very valuable. Okay, that, that's 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 great. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, and I think actually the sort of the embracing of the organisation is the key is the stakeholder management piece, I guess, from the security team to the rest of the business um, and selling the value upwards and downwards and across the, or and across the organization, I guess. Um, so, so looking, Nick, Nick, Nick mentioned to our policies there, Martin, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll address this to you again, if I may, Martin, um, about, the, about policies and about the need to review policies. So, so I guess what we're saying here is that the, 
that the key here is to ensure that your policy framework, and let's be honest, policies are never usually seen as a fantastic, you know, fantastic news for an organisation. As Nick said, you know, policies are still king, but they're all seen as a bit of a sufferance by many in the organisation. Um, what you're saying here is actually the, 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 the importance of authoring policies at the right level to manage these risks is fundamentally important rather than the sort of a cut and paste type activity that quite often goes, go, goes hand in hand with policies. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it's a, it is a, it is a good one. It's um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, lots of, lots of people on this call probably uh, uh, wouldn't like to see another policy if, it, if they could help it probably. Um, but it, but it, 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 it is, it is important. It can be, it can be a real differentiator then to be honest um, when you, when you can, you know, develop a policy based on controls that you actually need. It's, you know, you, you can put controls in there, you know, almost that are very similar to an industry-wide security-related standard um, that are out there. Lots of them are out there. Um, you can re repeat those in a, in a policy or standard document. But then when it comes to um, maybe sort of trying to implement those policies, you might have a lot of exceptions because, you know, the organisation hasn't been, hasn't evolved enough maybe to, to adopt those uh, controls. So, so if you can get a policy written based on risk, then you have got a set of, a set of policy controls that you, that you really need. Um, there shouldn't be any more than 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 you do need. There shouldn't be any controls there that shouldn't that shouldn't have been um, you know scoped out and budgeted based on risk. So so you can start to drill into the kind of controls that you that you actually really do need from a, a risk perspective. And that also helps then um, in your in relationship with third parties, for example. You can say to them, we really need you to demonstrate this particular control. Um, third party because based on that then we'll be opening ourselves to a bunch of vulnerabilities on the risk side of things so so in terms of exceptions and getting the the discussion through with third parties about what they, what is mandated in the policy um, becomes much much easier and straightforward once you've based it on risk yeah and I think I'd also add to that Martin if I may that uh, the importance of having a healthy uh, dose of aspiration in policies is also important so if you, if you write them at the correct level and also have that level of aspiration. Um, and I think that's perhaps a, a something that organisations tend to fall into quite frequently. They write policies that support the systems they've got today, which includes very often legacy systems, et cetera, or systems that are quite old. But of course, that doesn't actually drive forward their maturity in any significant way. And actually that concessions or that uh, exempt, exemptions programme is, is, is really important at, at driving that to make, to make the organisation better ultimately, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'll, I'll definitely agree with that, Simon. And yeah, and you, you've got a lot of experience yourself as well in the, you know, the policy side of things. So um, yeah, so de de definitely agree with that, Simon. Yeah. Okay, th thanks for that, Martin. Well, um, I think if we uh, move on to the next slide as we enter the the, the, the fourth section here, um, uh, we've had a couple of questions actually asking about the webinars we mentioned during the intro, which are available on the CM CMRG website. If you'd like to look at those, but we'll send a link out with you too. Um, so we've talked, Nick has also taken through some of the theoretical parts here and how it should look. Um, I'll hand over now to Martin. So actually, you know, let's take that theoretical and let's, let's, let's see how that looks in terms of practical. Martin, over to you. Yeah, th thanks, Simon. And to give, uh, give Nick a little bit of a rest uh, for a few minutes, um, but there's a little bit of a segue into a couple of case studies that I'd like to sh share with uh, everybody on the uh, on the interactive session today. Um, and, and as Simon mentioned there, it is, you know, the, the, the theoretical um, parts of a risk assessment process, you know, any risk assessment process um, is, is very, very important to understand the, the nuts and bolts of those, the various stages that, and the phases that you go through, um, you know, involving different, different stakeholders throughout the process and all the rest of it. It, 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 is, it is also um, very reliant, uh, I would say, um, and I'm sure Nick would agree, on, on the people that are actually driving these risk assessments. So um, typically you know, very experienced uh, risk assessors, um, you know, in the cybersecurity team that have uh, connections and relationships that have been formed internally uh, also over, over a number of years. So, so based on their knowledge is, is really the most successful part of making sure that you can start to implement um, a risk assessment process or, or approach within an organization. Um, and so, so to sort of build on some of those, there's, there's two case studies here. Um, the first one is a, uh, just a bit of a background really, a profile. There's a manufacturing uh, organization, small and medium enterprise based in um, Europe. Um, so they're, they're, they're very much sort of in the, in the manufacturing field, maybe in sort of to, to help with just in time uh, kind of production line because 
availability for this organization was uh, was key out of the you know the, out of the CIA triad it's uh, its availability is the is the number one um, element for them so in in this example what we what we did was with this with this organization is, is very early on you can start to understand um, the kinds of um, parameters that you might be working with when you when you're when you're trying to maybe implement a risk assessment uh, process for this organization so firstly to capture as we sort of said throughout some of the Q and A um, earlier on is, is to capture this information, really get to grips with the organisation and what they do. Um, it's going to be very different from um, maybe a financial services organisation where sort of we might be sort of leaning towards confidentiality issues uh, primarily. So it's really sort of get under the skin of what this organisation is all about, because that will help you later on in the risk assessment um, in terms of some understanding some of those um, profiling and scoping of the risk assessment to help you with understanding what is the business impact, uh, the threats that this organisation might be facing. Um, and what they can actually do about it, primarily from an availability point of view, but also not discounting, you know, some of the information that they might be capturing might, might still be confidential um, or shouldn't be shouldn't be subject to change or alteration in terms of integrity. Um, so they're a manufacturing organisation. Uh, availability, we've already discussed, is is important. The other key um, aspect of this particular engagement is the large number of applications that need to be risk assessed. So this is an organization that was um, at the time and, and probably it still, it still is um, on the up in terms of um, its its wider sort of market awareness. People are people have been coming on to understanding what this organization can provide in terms of um, its manufacturing capabilities. So they were starting to build a, a strong brand and, and reputation. But off the back of that, they had quite a lot of applications that, that hadn't really been risk assessed um, ever, really. There might have been some, as I sort of said earlier, maybe some paper-based high-level risk assessment to understand, okay, well, this is a critical component or this is a key application because of what it does as part of the manufacturing um, production line um, but there's been no sort of real awareness about well if this um, particular cog went down for a certain amount of time what does that mean in terms of the impact to not just financially for this organization um, but also their brand reputation um, any compliance requirements that might have come for that because they're part of a uh, supply chain as well so so it's, it's very very Quickly, we, we went went to went into this organisation, knowing what these risks were, the, the the specific nature of the risk assessments that we needed to perform here for this organisation, um, and then, yeah, just the final final one that there, there wasn't really sort of much to go on in terms of previous risk assessments. So, um, next slide, if that's okay, Nick. Um, so that's kind of setting the scene um, a little bit. <clears throat> um, but the primary one here is the number of um, applications the, and the availability issue for this organisation. So after you know, quite a lot of discussions in, in various workshops with this particular organisation um, and ourselves internally, internally within CRMG, um, we started to get a, a bit of a roadmap together, if you like, in terms, in terms of trying to understand was, is there, out of these set of applications, they, it, it was, it was almost I'd say it was around sort of the 80s or 90 uh, in number applications or systems that need to be risk assessed. So was there first of all sort of a, a way that we could categorize those applications or systems together? Is there similar types of information that they might be capturing on these applications? Is there um, is there similar types of operations that these um, these applications need to do? To, do, they, do they talk to a certain amount of applications in, in, um, amongst themselves in terms of integration? So there was a few, there was quite a few sort of discussions that we had at that level to understand whether we could actually build, put together um, out of these 80 or 90 applications, could we categorise them with you know similarly how they were. Um, how they were, you know, the, the information that was stored on them and what they were doing. Also, what, what kind of applications were or systems were being hosted elsewhere? Was there any external systems? Were, is, there, is there a number of these applications or systems that are internally hosted? Um, where is there, is there any of these that might be sort of on, you know, maybe linked to sort of a cloud systems? All of those kind of discussions were, were sort of had to understand um, those that may be internal, those that might be sort of external, um, those that might have, you know, very sort of very sensitive or critical information on them. So, so in, in that kind of way, we were able to, to categorise them into um, five or six categories in the end, 
whether they were you know a bunch of internal applications uh, another bunch that were being serviced or outsourced but um, provided by another um, by, by a third party organization um, those that were already sort of kind of crown jewels applications as well were sort of treated separately as well so so out of those we had a, a more manageable set then to actually start doing risk assessments based on the information that we that we had there in terms of the categories so what, what that, that helped us then is, is for example, in, a, in maybe let's, let's, let's go for sort of the crown jewels types of applications, we could then we could then assess a set of applications and, and ask the kind of questions from a um, business impact point of view. What is the, the 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 impact of a loss of confidentiality, integrity, primarily availability of these types of crown jewels um, systems? So based on these systems having you know really important or most the most important information what is the impact from a financial um, compliance operational health and safety point of view um, if they were unavailable if there was a confidentiality issue or integrity issue um, going forward so so you could start to have um, you know a real informed discussion of those that would then the, the, when you came to the internal applications then you get a different set of impacts um, based on based on those and that was the way that was the way forward really in terms of then the threats um, assessment um, as it says says there one of the bullet points we could develop start some threat templates for each category um, in that you might have they might have seen historically um, different threats that might have been affecting the uh, crown jewels applications as opposed to those that might be internal based it's because you you start to sort of maybe include some of the um, you know, you know, sort of suppliers and the risk associated with maybe privileged employee access that sort of thing to um, to more critical applications than those that might be um, based internally. So we start to get so to deliver a set of categories for the business impact assessment. Then we can get a set of threat templates, um, you know, based on which category those um, applications found, them, found themselves in. Uh, and then but working sort of working way, way through then in terms of identifying some of the controls, um, we could start to look at, okay, if, um, if there was a, a significant number or, diff or types of threats, either from, um, uh, quite quite well resourced um, hacktivists. It might be, um, you know, as, as I said, kind of privileged employees. It might be from suppliers. Um, what are the kind of controls then that we need to put in place for um, uh, for those more critical systems, as opposed to maybe the, the internal ones that might not have um, third parties or suppliers um, involved in in their in in their their outlook. Um, so that, that kind of then, if, then then sort of helped to inform you know the kind of controls that you, that you could that you could put in place and say well if we you know if we had um, an anti anti malware control because this this particular application is on uh, is on the internet um, then the types of threats that we'll be able to mitigate with those we could then say well that we can start to start to say in terms of priority order which controls would help to mitigate the the larger number of threats um, coming out of the risk assessments. And then so what's progressing from there is then um, because there are quite a lot, quite a large number of applications, there is a developing sort of a, a way in which the senior management of this particular organization could understand, you know, what are the, what are the threats, what is the business impact uh, assessment looking like, looking at, looking at the controls almost on a page really. Um, so that's, that's really sort of presenting a snapshot of results that the senior management can sort of say, okay, we can, we can see that the threats are, the threat landscape is looking at a particular um, top Top 10 for example uh, we know which controls we need to focus on um, primarily and then it's, it's the job then of the senior manager, management then to understand okay well if we if we target the biggest bang for buck controls as a priority and work our way down then we've got somewhere to start that is much more effective than just putting a compliance based um, assessment in, 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 in place so so from the from understanding what the key threats were we can understand what the the, the key controls were um, distinguishing those from the, 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 the kind of projects that we're already doing from a business, uh, business as usual perspective um, and trying to maybe regret, maybe um, promote to them that they, they can invest in a set of controls that would help to you know, mitigate, mitigate the risks you know, on a priority, prioritised basis. But in a sort of taking a step, step back from this organisation, that's kind of the approach that we that we took there. That that you can you, know, you can go go along with the risk assessment approach for the the distinct phases of having a business input assessment, understanding what the threats are, um, selective controls. But you also sort of need to be cognizant of the actual organisation that you're going into, understanding for this organisation that availability is is key, um, understanding that if if applications were down for a period of time, they had real direct financial implications, and even sort of wider uh, compliance or contractual obligations that need to fill as part of the supply chain. 
And you can start to then focus on those applications that are more critical than the others. If you have a large list of 80 to 90 applications or systems to do a risk assessment on, you also then need to know well, which, what are the critical, the key 20 of those to then to start to understand the, you know, the kind of controls you need to put in place to mitigate the, the, the vast number of threats there. So it's all about really trying to prioritize um, the types of uh, applications or systems that you need to risk assess um, of those and then also prioritizing the controls based on understanding what the threats are to those particular controls in this case from a availability perspective. So if there, if there was going to be sort of one key takeaway from this first case study here is uh, very much sort of focus on, 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 on understanding what the, the risk assessment stages are um, and, and how to perform each of the stages of the risk assessment process. But in this case, getting under the skin of the organisation and really getting get into grips with um, the types of um, threats that they're facing, um, the, threats, the, the controls that you need to focus on on a prioritised basis, that so you're not starting with you know, putting in, in place governance controls and then policy controls, you're really starting with the kind of controls that you need to have in place like anti-malware, for example, or um, access control or asset management. Some of those things that have been tied straight directly back to a set of threats that you've, that you've identified here for this organisation. And then finally, sort of then, you know, it loops back to some of the risk register questions is making sure that you have a timeline for making sure that the risk mitigations are in place, who's going um, to, is going to put these, put these controls in place, and that they're reported on a, on a regular basis. So there's some um, continuance of understanding that we've got a key set of risks here, we're doing something about them, we're reassessing them in a, in an agreed, um, agreed time scale and making sure that we're, uh, we're, we're addressing risk as we, as we go through. So that's um, the, pretty much the, the first um, case study there. And it, and it, and it does, you know, it does, as I said at the beginning of the, the case studies um, itself, it, it does rely on, you know, it's, it's a very good, um, talk, good, very good approach for risk assessment um, here that uh, Nick's been outlining. Um, but you, you also do need to go with your knowledge and experience that you built up over, you know, over a number, of, a number of years doing risk assessments to really understand how it can be applied in different organizations. Um, so jumping into the, the second case study, and, and it is quite different um, this time. It's um, it is th this is probably a bit more sort of taking different elements, I would say, in different stages that Nick has um, Nick has outlined earlier on. In that this is again this this is a very much a sit an SME based in the UK. This time financial services and not manufacturing. So you can start to um, you know probably preemptively say that sort of confidentiality um, to a lesser extent, integrity and availability is, is, is key here. Um, but but this, this, this came from a position of a, of a bit more maturity than the last organisation, I, I would say, and probably Nick would agree with me as well, in that they already understood what the, or, or, or had identified what the key threats um, were to the organisation as a, as a whole. Um, obviously being a financial service organisation, they had yeah, and they still have uh, significant um, compliance obligations, um, and they they were they were in comparison, you know, quite you know, quite mature, uh, small cybersecurity team, but they had um, distinctive um, different different types of the team that were focusing on um, threats, for example, red teaming and blue teaming, um, compliance that then came under the security team as well, and operational teams um, to support those. So they had a, a small but but very streamlined and effective information uh, so, cybersecurity team at, at, that, at that time. Um, so the requirement there, the final one there, is, is to make sure that the threats that they identified uh, were matched up against controls that would, would very clearly um, help to mitigate the threats that they, they had already identified from the organisation. So um, getting into, the, into, the, um, into grips with this one then is the approach they took to identify what the <coughs> key threats were to the organisation. They had a quite, a, quite a large consensus of um, different parts of the organization coming together, cybersecurity being one, legal, um, HR, business continuity, all of those kind of distinct teams came, to get, came together to understand what their, at the time I think it was a top, top 10 of um, threats that they had identified for, uh, for the organization. So some of those could be removed, they might be in sort of maybe non-security threats. They're left with maybe about eight of those that the security team was primarily responsible for. Um, and they came up from a from a consensus discussion again, not really, I would say, based on anything more um, 
uh, rigorous really than 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 what the experts within the organization had seen so they they had brought the red team the blue team the operational team uh, threat intelligence specialists and and even anybody that were, that had been involved in any um, threat identification or any incidents in the past they've seen a bit of a, a theme or a thread of in the past so they formed a set of um, eight clear um, threats that the organization uh, was facing that the cybersecurity team you know, needed to need to understand what they were to, understand, to then understand what they can actually do about them or what they are doing about them um, so once they identified these these kind of eight um, uh, threats through information security um, the discussion here then sort of brought, brought us at CRMG into play to understand that, to understand what these threats were and what are the key controls that they need to put in place to help mitigate them so this was quite a quite a distinct kind of mapping exercise between understanding what their threats were and then matching up matching up to a clear clearly identified control that would help to mitigate the threats um, or the, the impact of the threat going forward so it wouldn't necessarily be you know one control would help to mitigate one of the threats it would be maybe a set of controls um, in all likelihood that might be then put together that would help to reduce the um, the, the impact or uh, or even sort of the likelihood of of a threat being successful to this organization so um, so that's a quite, a quite a distinct kind of mapping exercise from the threats to controls but then what you can start to get to grips with here is if you again if you take it piece by piece like with the last case study if you do you know um, one threat then the next threat then the next threat um, you can start to identify the the important or critical controls that will help you mitigate these threats. Um, so out, out, out of the, 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 um, this, this case study in, in particular, we had a set of eight threats mapped to a whole set of critical controls um, that would help to mitigate or manage those threats um, better going forward. What you start to understand then is, and it was quite an in, in, interesting piece, was then were there any of these controls that went across all eight or at least six of these threats that you could say, well, this is, a, a you know a really important control we need to make sure this this particular control because it maps to maybe six of these threats that have been identified for the organization we need to make sure this control or this set of controls are working well within this organization um, and that's where the effectiveness comes in in this, in this kind of fourth bullet point is to, is to then assess whether these um, these really critical controls these are the controls that are mapping against more you know the most number of threats are they are they working in place for this particular particular organization these are the controls we really need to make sure need to be in place and working well because they are mapped to the most number of uh, key threats across the organization and um, so that's when you, you you go out then and you know do the control selection um and part of the implementation making sure then working with the various teams within the organization making sure that these controls are in place looking for evidences of where um where there might be a, a snapshot of information that they could they could provide in terms of dashboards of uh, you know where, where the controls are working well or not well or not working well and then start to get then to put together a roadmap of making sure that the controls then um are being owned by a certain part of the organization they're reported back on a very regular basis it might even be on a on a weekly call for example with this organization it was to make sure that this, these particular controls needed to be working well very quickly <coughs> and that was um, that was that was um, pretty much a, a weekly call that, they, that these guys had to make sure these critical controls were in place and by the time we you know by the time we were sort of um, then coming out of this engagement they had all of their critical controls were uh, being reported on be, be either either working well at the moment or they had uh, um, activities or projects to make sure these controls were working well within a, a defined um, period um, and then as you know going back to sort of one of the points that Nick made um, in the presentation then they could start to then roll back into um, updates and the security policies standards the third party agreements um, with clear controls um, linked to these linked to these critical controls um, uh, to make sure they're working well with all the all these different stakeholders and um, so in a in a kind of a, a nutshell for this one this was you know, taking their, their their eight key threats key risks identifying the, the critical controls those controls that went across you know one or more of these threats and making sure that then the controls were implemented working working effectively um, that people had um, you know, real ownership and evidence to support the, the reasons why these controls were in place or were going to be in place within a within a defined period of time um, so there's there's two there two distinct case studies first is uh, adapting a, um, a risk assessment approach 
uh, for the for the manufacturing organization identifying any sort of categories of controls or threats that we could put together and then this second case study is, uh, you know, is, is is almost sort of taking key elements really of the risk assessment approach and making sure that you can apply um, you know a, a, a certain degree of, of rigor here to make sure that the threats you've, you've identified uh, map onto key controls and making sure those controls are working well on an ongoing basis so um, so that's that's really it from a a slight segue into two case studies. Um, so back over to you, Simon. Hi, Martin. That, thank you for that. Um, and I think uh, hopefully that's uh, helped sort of illuminate um, what the practicality for moving from that theoretical to the what actually happens at the business end. Obviously, it has to be fairly generic, but we, we're talking there. But hopefully it gives you some ideas to think about. Uh, personally, I particularly like the identification of critical controls. Um, so the things that matter to you most. And, and I think under... Uh, on the last page there, updating the policies and having no exceptions for controls that are considered critical. I think that's a, a really good piece in terms of keeping your organisation secure. Mm. Uh, if we'd like to, if we could move on um, now to our final section, uh, which will be cyber risk in the future. I know, Nick, that uh, you, you're incredibly passionate about this, so I'll just hand, hand over to you now. Okay. <laughs> um, good. All right. Thanks. And uh, thanks, Martin for that. Um, yeah, so I want to basically finish off here with <clears throat> a kind of a, a little bit of a crystal ball gazing, if you like, what we think uh, cyber risk is going to look at like in, into the future. But I think there's a, it's worth just taking a look at kind of where we've come from here. Um, because, you know, there are a number of factors that I think, you know, are important to understand how things have, how things have changed. And, and this is really uh, aimed this slide aimed at emphasizing um, why cyber risk is is more important and it is the future for for security functions absolutely no doubt about it um, you know in the past if you looked at attacks um, you know there wasn't really too much interest in making money from them all that notoriety um, you know they tended to be fairly low low level and I think if you consider how less re rely reliant we were on on systems ICT you know 20 30 years ago and it probably gives us a good indication as to why it's absolutely imperative to get right today but you know obviously we've seen some key sort of um i hate to use this word but key game changes and and i think the key one you know in 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 our experience and in my my own experience being in cyber security for hundreds of years now is is really all this uh, uh, the focus around the financially driven um you know because all of that money is getting plowed back into more sophisticated attacks so you know, 30 years ago, I think actually a number of factors, cybersecurity wasn't such a big deal for a number of reasons. We weren't that reliable on uh, systems and, uh, and digital information and ta tax tends to be low level. But, um, but now it's a real big problem. And um, I don't know if many of you are aware, but, um, you know, earlier this, earlier this year, um, uh, the largest DDoS attack occurred, you know, 2.3 terabits. Uh, and uh, against uh, Amazon, AWS. I mean, Amazon had talked about it. I think, it, I think they said it took place in February. Um, but, you know, what? and the reason I mention that is I think DDoS is probably a threat that we all thought had gone away, or at least, you know, what was, a, was a, an attack that, you know, was easily to manage. And, um, you know, and clearly, um, you know, clearly these types of attacks are coming back into play. I think the other factor that's, that's starting to make you know, the world that we operate in look particularly ugly at the minute is the, the influence of geopolitics. Uh, it's almost uh, a direct correlation, um, whether it's uh, one country putting sanctions on another country, um, whether something's been said on, you know, Twitter or whatever that's upset another country, you know, it's, it's, it's a big problem. Um, and the reason I mention that geopolitics and nation states is because we can't ignore it either. Um, you know, your organization may make an announcement, for example, about, I don't know, an infrastructure project in a certain part of the world, um, you know, may want a particular contract with a, you know, um, an organization that um, is of interest to a particular nation state. The, these factors often, they seem fairly innocuous, actually can start to, you know, turn the crosshairs onto your organization. And that's why when we start to look at risks and particularly profiling the threats, um, we need to consider some of those geopolitical aspects. Um, and, and again, just to emphasize, you know, if, if, if ever there's a, you know, you get pushed back in your organizations about, um, you know, the, you know, where the cybersecurity cyber attacks are really such a big deal and whether the media have got a, 
you know, gone crazy. Well, this, you know, this may be a, a sort of illustration that, that helps you present that argument, you know, from the from an organization that's reasonably well known called the World Economic Forum. And you can see, you know, <laughs> pretty close to what's known as climate change is uh, cyber attack. So again, um, it's it's becoming an area that we have to we have to manage the risks associated with this. And you know we can't bury our heads in the sand and just think that we can do this lightly. Um, you know, clearly we don't want to over-engineer it, and hopefully I've sort of sort of explained some of the, the sort of tools and techniques on how to get started in this area. Um, but it has to be taken, you know, very seriously in, in your organisations now. Um, the other point I wanted to talk about, obviously we're talking about the future, so I just want to set out a couple of, of predictions here. Um, it, it's pretty clear to us that uh, legislation regulations is becoming much more explicit about the need now for adopting a risk-based approach to security. And um, and ultimately, we you know we're we're a big supporter of that. It's very good to see. It's it's nice to sort of see it written down in you know in legal speak. Um, the the other point. I wanted to highlight here is about recruitment. You know, we've always had a big challenge around recruiting good, uh, you know, skill sets in cybersecurity. There is a huge, um, you know, demand and, and not so much of a supply. And um, and this is why I think it's because cyber risk is a business um, is a business that is a business risk at the end of the day. It it is important to look around the organisation for a better word is as for those individuals that can help your um, cyber risk capability. And I do think, as Martin explained in his case studies, you know, some of the challenges that we, you know, we managed to overcome uh, in those case studies, and we, you know, it's not always that plain sailing, trust me, you know, but some of the challenges that we nearly always face is about um, articulating to the business, or at least trying to grasp that business understanding as rapidly as we can. You know, that was the key success factors I think Martin highlighted in at least one of those case studies. So if we can accelerate that with knowledge from, you know, recruiting people into the business, into cybersecurity, you know, either full time or, you know, just doing some kind of intern, um, that does, in my experience, and I've done this lots of times, that does help um, accelerate and get you, you know, quicker results and, um, you know, and win hearts and minds for people in the business that, you know, may not have that same view about cybersecurity. Um, so that's that's you know that's another sort of prediction that uh, I think we are seeing now and we will see going forward. Um, the third area here is, is is a real hot topic, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this. We did say we would touch on quantitative, but I just want to do a little bit more than just touch on it. Um, we're seeing a huge amount of interest in quantitative uh, risk assessment approaches. Um, we're actually looking at developing uh, one ourselves with with, with Galvanize. It's one of those areas that's developing very fast. It's one of those areas that I think is um, is becoming important for organisations in certain situations with a certain level of maturity. Um, the, one of the one of the features I notice about quantitative risk based approaches is its capability for um, the outputs generated and ability to integrate into other key areas of the organisation. Um, in particular, looking at capital adequacy. Um, and again, this is an area that I think we're going to run a separate webcast uh, webinar on. Um, but, you know, a lot of organizations at the minute, they are like, like what happened with the financial crisis. They're ramping up their capital adequacy um, in their organizations. So capital adequacy is really about you know, how much an organization can set aside for you know, a lot of unforeseen events. And typically it's, it, it's, it's, it's big in the financial sector. Um, but you can start to look at influencing and managing that based on your, you know, your experience of managing risk. And we're talking big numbers here, so you can influence and reduce that capital adequacy by being able to demonstrate good risk management principles. Um, you know, that could be a big chunk of money you can stick into, you know, research, investment, whatever it may be. So, uh, and quantitative approaches, that's, you know, that is going to help to um, inform some of those more business-driven strategic objectives. Um, right, just ju jumping to ahead, I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, two things here. One is the what we call the real-time uh, cyber risk assessment and a mo possible model for this. And then the other, I'm just going to have a quick look at quantitative and give you kind of an industry perspective. Um, so this, this idea of this sort of real-time cyber risk assessment, um, it's not that far off. 
you know, obviously we've talked here about the foundations getting started, um, how you can evolve your cyber risk capability. Um, but again, remember there is a lot of information um, that we're gathering and it's quite dispersed. You know, it's, it's a range of different security tools and systems. Uh, we aggregate it as well and as much as we can, but it's, it's, it's not always that well aggregated for a number of reasons. You know, uh, you may have, you know, one tool that looks and collects information on a threat that has a different threat name than another tool. So trying to bring all this information together is, is really um, is the crux that we're trying to solve. But in cyber risk assessment, one of the things that we can do is that we can start off with, you know, our approach, our methodology, our agreements and things like what the threat lists are. And then we can start to correlate out to these different data sets. So if you're running your, you know, your vulnerability scans, for example, and you've got a GLC platform, you can start to integrate this information and based on your maybe your control library, you can start to correlate the different types of data sets to can help you influence and tell you in real time, you know, or real time as much as it can be real time, you know, what the state of play is of uh, the control effectiveness for, I don't know, maybe, you know, access control, malware signature updates, uh, configuration changes. There's a range of different uh, sources of information that can help establish that. Now, the one thing I would say, and this I think is probably the mindset, and I would include myself in this, in this area, the mindset I think we sometimes have in cybersecurity is we, we try and achieve that sort of, try and go for the silver bullet, okay? So again, it's all about evolving this approach. If you can start to feed in, you know, three, four, five, six different types of data sets to help uh, give you a better update in terms of, you know, what the level of threat is or levels of controls, then you're in a good place to start expanding that out. Um, but anyway, that's the idea that we have in CRMG about this real-time cyber risk assessment. And we you know, strongly believe this can be achieved. Okay, so let's, let's look at this other aspect in terms of this second component in the future uh, for cyber uh, risk assessments. And that's about quantitative techniques. Um, we see and we hear and we have a lot of discussions with a range of leading individuals around the world, uh, both in qualitative and both in quantitative. And I think it's probably fair to say that, you know, the cybersecurity community at the minute is, is maybe a bit divided on this. Um, but, you know, whether you're divided or not, um, quantitative risk assessment, you know, can't, shouldn't be ignored. It, it's, becoming, it's becoming a very interesting area. Um, again, you know, we can't expect this to be the silver bullet. Um, I think that the, you know, the approaches that are needed to, uh, to establish a quantitative capability uh, should follow. These are, you know, these are all sort of opinions should follow an, an ability to at least have a qualitative approach uh, started within your organization. The reason I say that is it doesn't take too long for uh, individuals, stakeholders, members of the team, security team, to start wanting to get a better understanding around the metrics uh, and maybe some you know uh, deeper objective insights into possible financial impacts that is exactly the thread you need to start introducing quantitative uh, techniques and the range obviously there are a range of different quantitative techniques uh, in cyber security um, I'll, I'll take a look at these very very briefly um, but again the 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 point that I think is important when it comes to looking at quantitative techniques is not just about having a, you know, a qualitative approach established so you can move on. I think it's also important that you've got to focus on um, having that conversation uh, with stakeholders in the organization. And that's why the, the bottom right hand call, um, box there about having avoiding this sort of discussion around the quantum physics conversation we're all you know a lot of people are interested in that but you know when you try when you try and get people to explain it simply it, it's really difficult not many people can and so that's what we don't want to get into when it comes to having those discussions with the business around quantitative risk modeling uh, there are certain sectors don't get me wrong that are well adapted to having those conversations insurance maybe finance because you know quantitative risk models is, exist in those organizations for looking at making uh, you know good risk-based judgments around uh, insurance premiums for you know, cyber security or building security building insurance etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so let me just share with you again this is a fairly you know embry embryonic model if you like it's very high level but i just wanted to share uh, 
some of the ideas that we have in CRMG about what a transition model could look like. Um, firstly, I think it is important to consider the target and profile or the scope, if you like, because I think there are certain systems that are well suited for carrying out quantitative risk assessment on. So, you know, systems, for example, that could be, um, you know, that could be the, a retailer's website um, or a settlement system. And the reason I say that these systems are good candidates for this type of quantitative model is because you've got to be able to, you know, like all of these risk assessments, qualitative or quantitative, you've got to put in some good information, good data. Um, and these types of systems will have that. So you will be able to understand quite clearly, you know, during peak trading times, maybe at certain times of the year, you know, seasonal variations, such as uh, you know, Christmas, for example, three weeks out from Christmas, you know, retailer websites, probably you have a good idea in terms of what amount of throughput revenue comes in into your dot-com environment. Um, so you're starting to get some really good information so that you can start to model different types of attacks. What happens if we have, I don't know, a DDoS attack, which, you know, as I explained before, is, is still in vogue as an attack time. We knock it, we knock, a, you know, the, our, our core website out for, you know, 72 hours during a peak trading time. You can start to quantify that quite nicely. Um, and obviously there are a range of different techniques and models you can use to help you establish that. Obviously Monte Carlo, AC networks, but also there's some, there's some, you know, much more sort of, I suppose you could say sort of basic approaches, techniques, such as the annual loss expectancy. Um, so you don't have to consider, you know, right away, these more complicated mathematical models that you feel obliged to be able to convey and articulate uh, to stakeholders. You can start to use uh, more sim simpler models, if you like. Um, but once you've carried out these assessments, it, it's always worth contrasting and comparing them with your qualitative assessment. So, you know, something like a retailer website, if you're in retail, um, maybe if you're, you know, in the utility sector or telco sector, you'll have a good idea in terms of, you know, the financial impact if some of your core systems go down. Um, and it's well worth comparing and contrasting the differences between a quant and a qualitative, just to see whether actually you're able to make better informed decisions or whether that information can be articulated to you know to stakeholders and, and it helps them to decide on actions to take um, but i think this whole area of quantitative it's something that we are as a company very interested in in exploring we do see it as you know as the future but we do see a kind of a you know an integrated approach for the foreseeable future between qualitative and quantitative um, so Okay, so I'd like to just wrap up, uh, I'm conscious of time and people probably wanted to move on to the next meetings, but what I wanted to do is try and capture uh, 20 years, uh, if you like, into, a, into one slide. So these are, you know, the, the sort of ultimate hint, hints and tips, if you like. Um, I think what, what is important is if you're going to initiate a cyber risk program or you've already got one, you know, take the obvious, focus on the obvious critical systems in your organization. Don't be scared about trying to initiate a cyber risk assessment for the first time on a key system um, because it gets that visibility. And everyone knows involved, the stakeholders realize it's a proof of concept. So, you know, the aim is not to create the most perfect solution the first time around. You need to establish that practical process. So don't try and aim for something that is, you know, that 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 is applies really good critical thinking that's quite complex to do ensure you've got a simple or straightforward process to establish that risk capability and then moving down the line here i think a phased approach is a good one to do so you might want to if you recall the seven different phases you might want to just conduct phase of step one and two so that was the profiling of the target environment and carrying out your business impact assessment you might want to do that for the first sort of six months before you start then assessing threats and vulnerabilities. Um, and that's, um, that's a really important uh, point to, to, I think, for organizations to adopt first time around. Um, and then I think the last point here is just consider the wider value these risk assessments and your risk assessment program will produce. We talked here about policies, using that information to drive awareness messages. So a range of, uh, of key uh, sort of hints and tips there to uh, to finish up on. So, uh, Simon, I don't know if we've got much time. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of out of time for questions, I'm afraid. Nick, if we can go on to the next slide, that'd be great. Just as a as a close and closing thoughts. Um, 
Firstly, I'd like to thank uh, Nick and Martin for, uh, for for working hard there through the two hours of uh, of content there. Um, I'm, and obviously, thank you guys for joining in today. It's been uh, it's been fantastic seeing so many of you join and so many questions. Apologies, we haven't been able to answer them all live or be able to type out all the answers. There really have been too many. However, we will be getting together and answering those questions and doing some follow up, including the slides and including a recording of. Uh, um, of this session so so you will get some feedback on those just perhaps not quite in the way we would ideally like to do it um, and there's there's our contact details we'd love to hear from you we'd love to connect with you on uh, on LinkedIn or drop us an email if there's anything you'd like to talk to us about we'd welcome that and also in terms of CRMG um, as I said earlier in terms of our looking for pragmatic solutions um, you know we are, we are we are we believe passionately in what we do we enjoy what we do and hopefully that come across in this session today um, that we are passionate so please keep in touch with us please follow us on twitter etc the other other vehicles we have there for keeping in touch um, we've had a couple of people contact us and ask if they'd like uh, for, for further masterclass sessions so again if there's anything you'd like to see or like us to cover again please let us know other than that i'd like to thank you all thanks to the speakers have a fantastic day and i hope you've got plenty of value from our session today thanks very much everybody goodbye thank you